Let's read Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is God's power for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For in it God's righteousness is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to pray in a moment, but uh, before I do, make sure your Bibles are open at Romans 1, 16 to 17. We'll also look at Psalm 31. There's an outline in the service sheets. Uh, if you open up the news, there's one there on the left-hand side. If you've got any questions, God willing, at the end, we'll have time to talk about any questions that you might have from the sermon. Let me pray. Father, thanks for today. I uh, thank you that you are the same today as you have always been and always will be. Thank you that your love never diminishes. Thank you that you have expressed it in the life, death and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, for rebels like us. Father, as we sit here today, aware, maybe even unaware of how much we do is because of the rediscovery of the Reformation. Please work on us by your Spirit. Please transform us more and more into the image of you, our Creator. Please fill our hearts with joy at your great goodness to us in Christ alone and send us out to tell this world of that truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that point one on the outline, and there'll be some slides coming up, and uh, hopefully the sound desk will be able to just follow the points. So the first slide should be up there. Beautiful, I love it. Uh, let me take you to a continent. The continent has been ravaged by drought and pandemic. The cities are growing larger. The pressure on food supply is growing. All the symbols of security, especially the church, even the political rulers, they're all being questioned. Literacy is rising. More and more people are being educated. There is access to information everywhere. Death is around every corner. Security is being questioned. And as people learn more, they start to question everything around them as they face a world more and more insecure. Does that sound familiar? I'm not talking about Australia. I'm not talking about a time more critical, more sinful or more dire than ours, but I am talking about a specific moment in history, the Middle Ages. Now, the continent is Europe. From the 1300s, more and more people had moved to live in the cities. Droughts and natural disasters had swept across the continent and put massive pressure on food supplies. Pandemics regularly decimated populations, up to 30% taken. And one author says, the shortness of life was never far from people's minds. That's where the Heidelberg Dance of Death woodcut came from, as death danced through the streets and took people, no matter who they were. At the same time, universities were being established rapidly. Academics were returning to the original languages of the great books and opening the Bible in Hebrew and Greek. And the universities were held up as a place to explain the world you lived in and help you understand it. Technology, technology had been developed to spread information. It wasn't the internet, it was the book. 1450s in Germany the printing press. And so opinions were printed and handed out to a population that could read more and more. And the symbols of authority, the church and the state, were being questioned more and more. There was only one church, and that church had had an influence across every part of life, almost a monopoly. But their power, called the Holy Roman Empire, was starting to crumble as people wanted their own independence and as local rulers increasingly sought to solidify their borders. Does that sound familiar? 
It didn't reduce the power of the church. It just focused it a little more specifically. The church was that authority that ran your life from birth to death. Every part of your life, every stage. The church was the one that said, this is what life is like and this is where your soul will be secure. The church was the one who dulled out salvation and revelation. The church was the one that had the keys to grace and to the Bible. And onto that grand stage of an age of crisis, Martin Luther strode out. Well, he didn't really stride. He kind of flopped and flailed, really. Uh, He really was a product of his times, and he was affected by everything around him in the same way. And God used that man who is so similar to us, who flew off the handle, who loved nothing more than beer and sausages, who was short-tempered and self-pitying. God used that man to take people back to God's word. And we're going to spend some time with Luther today. It's a strange kind of sermon. I've never preached a sermon like this, kind of like a biographical sermon, a mix of biography and the Bible. And we're going to have some snapshots. You'll see them there on your outline. And we're going to spend some time looking at this great event. As we're reminded, on, on this day in 1517, Luther did something that lit a bonfire that consumed the world. As we do, let me, let me just point out three limits. First, please remember there is only one church. There aren't denominations. Uh, there aren't different ways of viewing things. There is one church. The Reformation gives rise to Protestantism. Second, we're going to be skating over the surface. We're going to be skating over the surface, but let me encourage you to learn history, to spend time in history, to look back over past centuries. Let me give you a really small example. In 1527, as the bubonic plague swept through his neck of the woods, Martin Luther wrote a small article where the one may flee from a deadly plague. Does that sound familiar? Thirdly, the Reformation is not about new discoveries, new theology. The Reformation is all about rediscovery and return. Rediscovery and return to the Bible and what God clearly said in it. Well, let me give you a snapshot of Martin Luther. Next slide. Uh, Martin Luther, uh, there's a statue of Martin Luther, uh, there's Luther uh, up the top and there's his beloved Katie down the bottom. We'll get to Katie in a moment. Luther was a product of his times. Uh, His dad owned a copper mine, they were firmly in the middle class. He entered the world in 1483. Uh, His father desired great things for him that he would have opportunity and so his father wanted him to pursue law. By 1505, Luther had finished his arts degree and was heading towards his law degree. Uh, He'd been out for the day and he was coming home on his horse on June 30, 1505 to his hometown of Erfurt. He was caught in a violent thunderstorm. Lightning hit the ground nearby, threw him from his horse and as he fell, Luther cried out to the patron saint of all miners, Saint Anne, help me. I'll become a monk. Well, he survived and he kept his word. He entered a monastery on July 17 in 1505 to the great anger of his father, who didn't speak to him for many a year. Sound familiar? Set the course for the continent of Europe and the world. By 1507, Luther was ordained as a priest. 1509, he had his theological degree. I wonder if they're back to front, but who knows? October 18, 1512, awarded the degree of Doctor of Divinity in Wittenberg. A university had been established here in 1502 by the king of the area, Frederick the Wise, and Luther was given the chair of biblical studies, which was an amazing privilege. The head of his monastery, Johann von Staupitz, who had been his kind of confessor, whenever Luther was tortured, he went to von Staupitz. He'd set aside that seat for Martin Luther, recognising his wonderful ability in God's word. The first five years, he lectured 
Uh, he lectured on the book of Psalms, 1513 to 1515. He then turned to Romans, 1515, 1516, then Galatians, 1516, 1517, then Hebrews, 1517, 1518. And we're going to turn to that wrestling in a moment. But whenever he lectured, he wasn't just in an ivory tower because he also preached at church each week. What he lectured, he applied to the people in the marketplace and the street. He was concerned for great learning, but he was concerned for the great unwashed mass in front of him that he met every day. And he saw their confusion, how anxious they were about life, how desperate they were for certainty and what happened after death. And he bore the fruit of his, his wrestles and he brought the to bear on them. And he caused a controversy wherever he went. Now, in 1517, as Mary reminded us, he nailed 95 arguments to the door of the cathedral in Wittenberg, basically saying you can't sell salvation for dollars. And we'll turn to that in a moment. In 1519, he was summoned to a great debate with the leading church theologian of the time, Johann von Egg. Now, this guy was formidable. And he triumphed in the view of everyone because he got Martin Luther to say, I doubt the Pope. I doubt the church councils. I trust the word of God. In the eyes of many, Johann von Eck had won that debate because Luther went even further and he said that he supported anyone who wanted to reform God's people based on the word of God. And so in 1520, he published three long books, Got to remember, here's a guy writing with a quill by candlelight. <laughs> he wrote three massive books. The first asked the German political authorities to reform the church. The second said that the church was corrupt. There's only one church, remember. And the third said that every believer, every Christian before God was completely free and a slave to everyone. Well, by 1521, the church and the emperor had had enough. And they summoned Luther to a city called Worms and they demanded that he recant everything he'd written. There was amazement when people turned up and saw the pile of documents on that table. Surely no man could have written all that stuff, but Luther had. And in essence he said, I will recant if you can show me from the Bible where I am wrong. And he finished with famous words, here I stand. And at that point, the Reformation bonfire was ignited. It consumed Europe. Uh, Luther was already under the censure of the church. Now he was effectively under a death sentence. Thankfully, he had friends and they kidnapped him and took him to a castle in Wartburg and put him up in the tower. And do you know how he spent that year? As you would. He translated the whole New Testament into German. And not just any German but the German you heard at the butchers and the barbers and at the cattle markets so everyone could read it. Eventually he was allowed home. By 1524 he developed new ways of teaching children in households about Jesus Christ. He'd advocated for the development of public schools throughout Germany and especially the education of women. And in 1527 he married his beloved Katie, the last of a group of nuns who'd fled their order. Their marriage was contented and loving. They were devoted to each other. They ran an open home. Every day at lunch and dinner, they entertained up to 20 different students who would then sit around with Dr. Martin and talk about life, the universe, and Jesus Christ. Don't think Martin Luther was perfect. He was foul-tempered. He was stubborn. Uh, he suffered from self-pity. He was a contradiction. He was ill-tempered. He had huge bouts of depression. And God used him marvellously. He died in 1546. Like so many of his time, Martin Luther was grabbed by uncertainty. Next slide. I'm at point three on the outline. He knew the reality of death. It was everywhere. Uh, he knew the fear that the afterlife brought. What's going to happen to me after I die? 
He didn't know what would happen the next day. He didn't know what would happen forever. He knew his own nature. He knew what he was like inside. And in the theology of the time, he just flailed around like so many others, wanting some level of certainty. The theology of the time ran something like this. God is a righteous judge, completely impartial, who will judge you based on your deeds. His standard is his righteousness, which comes from his nature, which is perfect. To be righteous means to measure up to that perfection. To be justified is to be declared as someone who measured up to God's perfection. Grace was this mysterious substance that God gave you if you were humble enough so that you could keep measuring up, so that you could continue. The church had been given authority by God to dole out that grace through things called sacraments which govern every part of your life. And when you partook of that sacrament, you received a new infusion of grace to help you on your way until the next sacrament, until the next sacrament, until the next sacrament. The church had a treasury they could dull out extras from and that treasury was full of the excess grace that great Christians in the past had left over. Now they're broad brush strokes, but it helps you understand why life is so uncertain. Have I taken enough sacraments? Is my infusion up to date? Will I ever measure up? God is impartial. I know what I'm like. Let me read to you a quote from Martin Luther. I'd certainly wanted to understand Paul in his letter to the Romans. Everyone wants to do that, don't they? But what prevented me from doing so was not so much cold feet as that one phrase in the first chapter, the righteousness of God is revealed in it. I hated that phrase, the righteousness of God, which I'd been taught to understand as the righteousness by which God is righteous and punishes sinners. Although I lived a blameless life as a monk, I felt that I was a sinner with an uneasy conscience before God. I also could not believe that I'd pleased him with my works. Far from loving that righteous God who punishes sinners, I actually hated him. He's paralysed, isn't he? He hates the very God he's teaching about in the classroom. He's paralysed by doubt and fear because he knows his heart, he knows his nature, he knows his sin, he knows that he can do nothing before God to measure up to that perfection, no matter how many sacraments, no matter how many infusions of grace, no matter how regular he is, because the standard is to be perfect. And the reassurance of the church became increasingly convoluted from more and more sacraments dominating every part of your life through to developing the theology of purgatory where if you died uncertain and without measuring up, you could work it off and get in. Now, they're broad brush strokes, but turn with me again to the passage he wrestled with, Romans 1, 16 to 17, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because it's God's power for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, also to the Greek. For in it, God's righteousness is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. How could this be good news? How could it be good news that God's right anger has been revealed in Christ Jesus? How could that be good for a man like Martin Luther, like any human who knew their heart? How could it be good news that you will never measure up to God's standard and you'll face an impartial judgment one day? How could there be any hope for any person? How could this God who's so consistent in the Old Testament and the New Testament, how could that God be someone Martin Luther could turn to? And as he kept lecturing on Psalms and Romans, he kept wrestling with those two verses He prayed, he wrestled, he prayed, he wrestled. And a shaft of light came from that reading from the book of Psalms. Remember the reading that Ros brought us? Psalm 31 verse 1. Lord, I seek refuge in you. Let me never be disgraced. Save me by your righteousness. What? 
How can, how can that be in the Bible alongside Romans? Save me by your righteousness? How can I be saved by God's impartial, perfect standard? When I'm never going to measure up, how can I be saved by that? And when you realise who wrote Psalm 31, David, that adulterous, corrupt, murdering king, and he says, God, save me by your righteousness. He drove Luther back to the Bible time and time again. And not just the Bible as it had been translated, but the Bible in the original languages. And as he read and read and read in the Bible and prayed and prayed and prayed, he realised that the words had been handled badly. And so the truth of God had been shrouded and obscured. Uh, let me continue that quote and let me uh, capture what happened to Luther. I was in desperation to know what Paul meant in this passage. At last, as I meditated day and night on the relation of the words, the righteousness of God is revealed in it. As it is written, the righteous person shall live by faith. I began to understand that righteousness of God as that by which the righteous person lives by God's gift, by faith. And this sentence, the righteousness of God is revealed, refers to a passive righteousness by which God, who is merciful, justifies us by faith. That immediately made me feel as though I'd been born again, as though I'd entered through open gates into paradise. And from that moment, I saw the whole face of Scripture in a new light. Uh, let me just very quickly take you through what Luther had come to learn because it transformed his whole view on life. And as I talk through these very quick steps, just remember what I said before. God's righteousness is his nature, who he is. To be justified is to be declared right with God, but the change was this. God does it for humans because they can never do it for themselves. God does it for humans. He gives them his own perfect standard. How does he do that? Well, it's revealed in that good news, the gospel, in a man called Jesus Christ who does everything for humans so that they can receive everything from God. And it's received by faith, by taking God at his word, by trusting him that Jesus lived the life we couldn't live so that he could die to take God's judgment for us and then rise from the dead and say, it's been paid, I've done it all for you, which changed his understanding of grace. It wasn't a substance. It was God's stance or attitude that he would give humans in his abundant generosity what they did not deserve. And where do you find out about all this? Well, in verses like Romans 1, 16 to 17, in the Bible alone. And so Luther brought people to understand these five truths that we've got up here on the screen. In Scripture alone, God revealed Christ alone, who offers grace alone, Received by faith alone so that anyone could be forgiven to show how wonderful God alone is. And that transformed the world. It wasn't a new theology but a rediscovery. And Luther didn't keep it in a lecture room. He then took it out to the streets because he realised what was happening out there in Wittenberg and in the towns around it was Luther's heart for people that took it out. You see, there was a marketing campaign going on, a marketing campaign that said you could buy grace. The church would give you access to that huge treasure chest built up by all those good deeds of the saints, and if you paid a dollar, you could take some time off in purgatory and get into heaven quicker. At the sound of a coin, your soul could go free. Come and buy it from us. And Luther exposed it for what it was, a corrupt and damning false teaching. And so he nailed those arguments on the door of the cathedral. 
I've always wondered what, what I would do one morning if I rocked up here and there were 95 arguments on the door. Well, they kind of faded into insignificance for a little bit and then someone started printing them. It's amazing what happens when you make information accessible and the bonfire spread, no matter what people tried to do and the truth was heard. I'm at the last point on the outline. Uh, An age of crisis, uh, a time when things are all uncertain, when people are questioning everything and Luther returns to the truth of God's word and the Reformation spread. Well, what use is that today? It's occupied your minister for a week so he can write a sermon. It's given us a different opening confession. We can sit in a building and not worry about persecution. But really, what does the Reformation mean? What do we do with it? Well, I think at least on a big picture, our age isn't that different to Luther's, is it? (laughs) An age of crisis. An age of crisis. And so I think it's worth thinking very quickly in four ways about why this is relevant to us today. You've got your outlines there. It says it there. Luther wanted people to return to Jesus alone. That alone would be enough to help people understand life. Jesus. Remember last week, Jesus is enough that he lived, died and rose for our sins because God gives us what we don't deserve and we just receive it. That transforms life. Now, Luther wanted everyone to know that truth. Everyone. He was a little in your face, a little intemperate in his language, but he was so desperate for people to meet Jesus. Do you think that's changed? Do you think there is any other answer to the age of crisis today than Jesus? Are we offering anything else? Secondly, Luther wanted people to meet Jesus in the Bible, the Bible alone. It drove him to translate the whole Bible into the language of the average German. By 1534, the Old and New Testament was in the language of the street in Germany. Anyone could read it. There are 80 of them in the building here today. In English, that we could read down the main street. Meeting Jesus in God's word, that hasn't changed, has it? Do you think maybe the spark is taken for granted, though? Do you know how dangerous that thing in your hands is? How if we let it have its way, if we submit to it, we will be consumed And life will be as it should be when we meet Jesus in those words. Luther wanted people to know God through Jesus better. His hope wasn't just that they would be able to recite some truths and know why December 25 was there. He wanted people to know God and everyone to know. Luther's basic premise was that any person could know God as Father through Jesus. As a child, as a plough hand, as a milkmaid, as a parent, as a professor. And so Luther exhorted everyone, parents and plough hands, choir masters, children, to know more deeply Jesus Christ in their households. And that's where Luther focused. He encouraged education so that we could teach each other, Germans could teach each other about Jesus. He wrote catechisms, which is really just a method of teaching. Luke 1, chapter 4, Acts 18, verse 25, there's the word. Simple questions and answers that we could learn so we would meet Jesus and know God more deeply as he's revealed in the word. Luther was under no illusion Anyone could know this. I I don't think that's changed, has it? Perhaps what's changed is our desire to teach each other those truths in our households. Luther wanted people to pray the Bible more. He had a deep desire for people to be dependent on the God who would save them. 
One such statement was prayer. Luther went to his barber one day. I don't know why he had to go to the barber with that little hair, but he did, went to the barber. And the barber said to him, Dr. Martin, how can I pray? Dr. Martin said he would put his mind to it, so he did, and he went home and wrote a book. <laughs> he took it to the barber, and in essence he said this, any person can pray, adult or child, plowhand or professor, educated or uneducated, anyone could pray. Anyone could be dependent on God. In fact, if you know the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments and the Apostles' Creed, you'll always have something to pray. Do you think that's changed? I don't think it has. Neither has our need for dependence. And let me tell you that already today in our service, we've had one of the tools, haven't we? We're about to have another in the Lord's Prayer. Anyone can be dependent on God. Let me pray. Father, we give you thanks that you are enthroned above all things and that you came in the flesh and walked in our streets. We give you thanks that your kingdom has been established and we desire for that truth to go out in this world. Father, we give you thanks that you provide our daily and eternal needs. You give us both bread and the blessing of forgiveness. Father, we pray that you'll protect us from apathy. We pray that you'll protect us from falsity. And we pray that you'll direct our hearts to Jesus alone as he's revealed in your word. Amen.